Коллеги, давайте заслушаем серию докладов. Well, let's have a series of presentations dedicated to the endovascular methods of stopping hemorrhages. And the first presentation is on neck traumas and brachiocephal artery damages. And um, uh, we have uh, uh, a doctor from uh, Finland to make the presentation, uh, please. Invitation. Uh, it's a privilege to be here, and we've been talking a lot about stopping hemorrhage, but actually, it's Dr. Pirka Vadikmata. Even more devastating, having a stroke and surviving, um, and a small niche uh, in the endovascular treatment, uh, uh, blunt cerebrovascular injuries. I have no conflicts of interest regarding this um, talk. Given the speed that the people are driving their cars here, I take that this picture is not very uncommon even in Russia. And we tend to think that uh, cerebrovascular injuries come from these uh, motor vehicle accidents and uh, major trauma. Uh, but uh, we, we know, also know that young patients have spontaneous dissections and the uh, line between a spontaneous dissection and a traumatic dissection is actually quite fine. Um, and uh, uh, some time ago I saw a guy, a surfer, who made a tacking and uh, got hit in his uh, neck by, by the wind uh, surfing, uh, by, 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 the, by the sail, and got a dissection. So is this a trauma or a spontaneous dissection? I don't know. Uh, the, truck, the, the, the car that was shown in the first picture belonged to a 20-year-old female who uh, in the morning traffic uh, got hit by a truck because of making a wrong turn. Uh, uh, was semi-conscious on site uh, uh, and was intubated, came to uh, the trauma hospital with a liver and kidney injury, uh, fast positive, treated uh, conservatively anyway, uh, no head or uh, neck fractures. However, she also had a bilateral ICA injury in the screening uh, CTA. She was taken to further imaging and uh, had a global uh, hemi-ischemia or more than hemi ischemia of his head. So the discussion was that uh, is this going to be an organ donor, but we were quite fast uh, on the line with her discussing uh, the issue. This is 10.05 10 in the morning, uh, and um, uh, she was taken to the NGO lab for, for bilateral uh, procedure, and uh, the more severe was stented first, the other one a bit later, uh, uh, four hours from the trauma. Uh, and now, <clears throat> I met her a, a month ago, she told me that she's just graduating as a nurse. She has some, she got a little stroke, uh, has some neuropsychological rehabilitation ongoing, but from organ don donor to nurse, I think this was an important uh, a couple of hours that we spent with her. So time here is an issue. <clears throat> um, therefore, uh, we need to screen, maybe, uh, for these damages, and if we don't screen, we, we will miss uh, this uh, odd patient. Uh, I put to together this slide because uh, about um, uh, half of the patients that get a complication are symptomatic, so half of them are asymptomatic. We do CT to many of them in the screening, so we have some patients who uh, we miss the treatment possibility in, some that are true positive and we do something, uh, and, and that's a success, of course. Then we have some false positive patients uh, that we do something in, uh, and we do not go to cause a complication. That's, of course, uh, 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 good luck. And then we have some uh, who would never have got a problem. We do something, and, and then uh, they get a, 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 a stroke because of that. So that's the victim of modern imaging technology. There are several protocols of which the, the extended Denver one is the most uh, well-known one. I have no time to go through it. Uh, 4th of June is the update of, of our local protocol uh, that we follow um, in Helsinki. What is the incidence of blunt, blunt cerebrovascular injury? It, of course, depends on the material that you have. Uh, at hand, uh, we can see that in the National Trauma Bank it was only 0.2% uh, from the ISS over 10 um, um, uh, so, but it's a couple of percent anyway from these more severe injuries. In our first series, we had a 15% incidence, so our screening was quite effective, but maybe uh, too harsh. Today, we, we, we tend to quote, quote that we should find about 5% in our screened population. 
Uh, from the uh, previous papers I showed, uh, uh, we have a rate of about 5 to 10 percent of stroke in the patients that have. Uh, it may be so that the anticoagulation strategies uh, uh, prevent most of these, but if we don't find we don't anticoagulate them, and then we probably have more strokes. This is from Houston, Michelle McNutt uh, paper uh, with the uh, with the polytrauma patients, there were isolated BCVIs compared to multi-system BCVIs from the 28,000 uh, over 16 um, admissions. 1.1% had a B uh, blunt cerebrovascular injury, but you, it's interesting actually that it both in the isolated and in the polytrauma patients, the stroke rate was about 10%. Um, this is important because the, the neuro uh, intensive care uh, patients that, that have a, uh, also a head trauma, these, these are difficult to distinguish from the, the cerebrovascular strokes. As we know, the uh, Bifli grading is, is uh, the best known one, that you have the less than 25% uh, stenosis, more than 25% stenosis, pseudoaneurysms, vessel occlusion, or vessel uh, transection. So does the grade go together uh, with the stroke risk? Yes, it does, but that's not very well uh, documented. And, uh, and uh, here also in the biggest series where uh, the, um, the William Scott paper is um, uh, divided to, to level grade one and two and, and grade three and four, we see some more, pay, more strokes in the uh, three and four categories, but sadly also in the grade one. So we cannot say that we should never treat uh, grade one patients. And also, the same patient may have all the grades because this is a patient from, from a couple of years ago with total occlusion in the first CT, one week control uh, was grade two, uh, more than 25% stenosis, and one year later he had grade three, like a pseudoaneurysm. So the same patient can have all of them. Um, mostly it is conservative therapy. I don't go through those, those but what I uh, uh, like to remind you about is the same paper. Uh, Michelle McNutt's first author, Houston, um, correct me if I'm wrong, that you had a policy that uh, 22 hours from brain injury and 48 hours from HB stability after solid organ injury, uh, you started antithrombotics uh, and aspirin uh, if no stroke symptoms. Um, this is a typical treatment, uh, which is quite uh, obvious today. They are mostly zone 3 uh, uh, damages. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, presenting uh, ideal treatment method is endovascular stenting, uh, fairly straightforward. In the late phase, some patients with a very torturous anatomy might be operated upon, like this one, a symptomatic post-dissection aneurysm uh, uh, for several years ago. But this is something that you do very, very seldomly. So in summary, it is an existing problem that we should find uh, in these trauma patients. Uh, screening seems beneficial. Uh, we should find the cases that benefit from urgent uh, therapy. The therapy is normally endovascular. Incidence is something like a couple of percentage. Uh, and from those that have the injury, about 10% get the stroke, maybe. Uh, it is unclear uh, which medication is the best one, but it is important that they have some medication. Late poor problems are quite rare. Uh, the pseudoaneurysm aneurysms probably uh, 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 benefit from follow-up. We have a protocol of following them up to uh, five years or, or three if they are smaller, and uh, I see them lately, and, and they often have some minor problems in the end. So we need protocols, uh, local or international. And I take the opportunity to invite you to Hamburg. We are organizing the European Society meeting there, and actually with Tal Hörer, we also organize a EVTM session uh, at the European Society Vascular Surgery meeting. Thank you very much. Colleagues, would you be willing to ask questions, please? Your question, please. So when you, uh, when you do end up stenting these, uh, which I presume is relatively infrequent. I've never done one. Uh, what kind of stent are you using? Stent graft or bare metal stent, self-expanding, balloon expandable? To, today we use dedicated carotid stents with the, with the double, uh, uh, so you have the bigger frames, uh, closed cell device, and then there's the smaller, smaller cells uh, within it, so to protect emboli. Uh, emboli. Uh, 
uh, normally those because they are very com very uh, go very nicely with the carotid artery, and you can embolize a pseudoaneurysm through the holes as well. Of course, you can use Viaban as well, but uh, we tend to think that they occlude a bit more frequently. Colleague, is there a Any other questions, colleagues? Please. Yeah, that was a great talk, um, very informative. What is your thoughts on the embolic risk with a uh, grade four lesion, ICA? Sorry, embolic? Em yeah, the, do you recommend a systemic anticoagulant for those people with a grade four? For a asymptomatic grade four? Yes. Uh, actually, in the long term, I think they need nothing because a grade four, if it hasn't caused anything, uh, this is something that actually Lauri is in our protocol still that they need anticoagulation, but uh, I reviewed that yesterday and, and then decided to recommend that they would get nothing. As you can probably imagine, the military has seen quite a few of these because of the blast injuries to the cervical spine, and usually with some neck fracture, you'll occlude a vertebral artery. And the military has adopted a posture of not wanting to anticoagulate soldiers because they can't redeploy if they're on an anticoagulant. Uh, aviators lose their flight status and people are chaptered out of the military on minimal retirement benefits. Uh, however, uh, I find in Denver there are a number of people who promote anticoagulants, especially uh, n interventional uh, neurosurgeons feel that there's some embolic risk, but I have not seen it. From, from the occlusion, I doubt that um, we actually don't have anyone uh, sufficient data or randomized studies or anything, but what uh, there's a bit more data on dissections of the internal carotid artery, and that seems that anticoagulation and antithrombotic medication is, is just as good. Any other questions, colleagues? Well, may I ask a question, doctor? Please tell me. Well, you know, based on our experience, very often dissectional traumatic aneurysms of carotid arteries are persistent for a long time and eventually they lead to a stroke. While the aneurysms of uh, visceral arteries in a few months' time are healed on their own. Do you have observations of similar type or maybe you have different uh, views on the natural course of dissection aneurysms? Yeah, the, you, you mean that the carotid artery should be treated more aggressively than the vertebral artery, also partly probably because of the collateral circulation is a bit different. Yes, I agree with you. The carotid artery should be approached more easily, but uh, what, what are the thresholds? I don't know, because many of these great three pseudoaneurysms fare quite well in the, in the long-term follow-up, so a too aggressive treatment uh, policy is also not good. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, and here is the next one. Uh, we'll talk about traumatic aortic injuries, current approach, and future technologies. Uh, Dr. Meiji from the United States, please. Спасибо и добрый вечер. I have no disclosures. So as you know, blunt thoracic aortic injuries are caused by rapid deceleration that leads to tearing of the aorta at points of fixation. That's usually at the ligamentum, arteri ligamentum arteriosum, just distal to the left subclavian artery. 85% of fatalities from this injury occur at the scene of the, of the accident, and very few patients who actually make it to the hospital alive die because of the aortic injury, rather due to uh, other injuries. And for that reason, our uh, current practice is for grade one injuries, which are intimal tears, grade two injuries, which are intramural hematomas. We treat with medical management most of the time because they don't tend to progress on post-operative, uh, excuse me, on follow-up imaging. However, grade three injuries, which are pseudoaneurysms, we treat with an elective T-VAR, and then grade four injuries, which are aortic ruptures, which are life-threatening, we treat with emergent T-VAR. 15, 20 years ago, we were treating these with open repair with left thoracotomy, uh, uh, partial left heart bypass, and now almost exclusively in the United States, almost 100% of these are done with endovascular techniques with uh, TVAR. So why such a dramatic change? Well, multiple studies have shown that there's significantly decreased mortality with endovascular repair compared to open repair, 
decreased risk of spinal cord ischemia, and decreased risk of renal failure. However, even more importantly than that, it's much, much easier to do a TVAR than to do a uh, open repair. And I would ask in the audience, how many people would prefer to have this left incision uh, compared to the right incision? Not very many, I don't think. But I think what we're often doing, however, is we're taking an acute problem and turning it into a potentially uh, chronic problem. So there's not a lot of long-term follow-up in these patients. Uh, this study from shock trauma had only 13% follow-up at five years. And that's potentially a problem because this study from Austria and Switzerland showed that failures occur out to five years at least. And um, about 5% of patients do require open revision for various uh, problems, and there's a very high mortality rate with open repair. Some of the problems include infolding of the endograft or uh, intraluminal thrombosis of the endograft, which is usually due to excessive graft oversizing, which is common in, aortic pati in, in trauma patients with very small aortas. So we had a very similar experience with a 16-year-old kid who got a TVAR and, uh, and thrombosed his aorta four months postoperatively requiring open repair. Now another issue is uh, the left subclavian. So because most blunt thoracic aortic injuries occur at the ligamentum arterius and just distal to the left subclavian artery, the subclavian artery is required to be covered in order to get sufficient proximal seal zone. And when you do that, you can still get a retrograde leak from the left subclavian around to the injury, so that's a potential source of endoleak, which may, and shown in the right slide here, uh, require embolization. Now for trauma patients, revascularization is considered to be elective in these situations. However, we do know that left subclavian coverage without revascularization is associated with a significantly increased risk of stroke of about four times, and specifically with posterior stroke of almost 12-fold increase. It also is associated with arm weakness, subclavian steel, and spinal cord ischemia, among other problems. So for these reasons, our guidelines, our societal guidelines in the United States recommend routine revascularization of the left subclavian artery uh, in elective TVAR situations. And that's usually achieved uh, traditionally with a left subclavian, uh, sorry, left carotid to subclavian bypass or transposition. However, these operations do increase the potential stroke risk and, uh, and uh, difficulty of endovascular repair if required in the future. And additionally, it takes several hours to do. So at our center, we've pretty much gone away from that approach and uh, moved on to some of these other approaches, which are novel methods for endovascular incorporation and revascularization of the left subclavian artery, including snorkels, thoracic branch grafts, in situ fenestration, and periscope sandwich techniques. So a snorkel is where a graft is introduced from the arm antegrade uh, and is involved in the proximal seal zone. The problem with this technique is that there's a gutter space between the branch graft and the T-bar graft in the aorta, and this can lead to a very high rate of proximal endoleaks. And for that reason, I don't advise using this technique. There's uh, thoracic branched endografts, which are on trial in the United States, uh, and they offer the potential for a off-the-shelf option at total endovascular incorporation of the left subclavian artery. They're not commercially available, at least in the United States, uh, but our center has been involved in the uh, studies for these devices and have uh, a large experience. The question, though, is how generally applicable is this device for most patients? Uh, the reason is because there's a lot of anatomical requirements in order to uh, enable use of this device. And we recently published our results showing that only about 25% of patients actually meet all of the anatomical requirements in order to use the branch grafts. But the most common reason for failure being the insufficient distance between the left carotid origin and the left subclavian artery origin. So uh, supposedly, I performed the first thoracic endobranch uh, uh, graft in the United States for a trauma patient, and uh, it went very smoothly. The patient was discharged. Unfortunately, four months later, he came back to me with a thrombosis of his uh, left subclavian graft, as you see here, and he actually had subclavian steel and required a left carotid subclavian transposition. So it's not a perfect device. Another option that's been talked about by many people is uh, in situ fenestration of the left subclavian artery, and this can be performed with a laser or with a radiofrequency wire. And in this situation, the endograft is placed up to the left carotid artery origin, covering the left subclavian artery. And then from the arm is introduced a laser catheter in this, uh, shown in this picture, and then that burns a hole into the endograft uh, and creates a space 
which then you pass a wire down the uh, endograft and then balloon the fenestration, then stent that fenestration into the left subclavian artery, and this shows that the left subclavian uh, flow is preserved. That was a case I just did a week ago. Uh, however, I've actually moved away from that, and now I'm predominantly, uh, my preference is the left subclavian periscope sandwich technique. And this technique, there's two endografts uh, for the aorta and a separate endograft for the left subclavian artery which is sandwiched between the two. So the steps of the procedure are that the first T-VAR is deployed just distal to the left subclavian artery. Then a wire is placed through the first endograft, uh, and a sheath is placed down to the descending thoracic aorta. A second T-VAR is then placed up to the origin of the left carotid artery. Then you shoot an angiogram to confirm the location of the left vertebral artery and deploy the stent graft into the left subclavian artery, just proximal of the vertebral artery. And here you see that the flow to the left subclavian and the vertebral artery is preserved. Then you perform a completion angiogram, and that shows here that the left subclavian is revascularized. What it looks like on postoperative CT scan is you have seal there in the proximal subclavian artery, you have a good proximal seal zone uh, at the left carotid artery, and then you have excellent uh, remodeling of the aorta uh, distally. And here's what it looks like um, with the graft in the left subclavian artery sandwiched between the two T-bar grafts. And then the proximal end of the graft uh, is in the subclavian, and the distal end is in the aorta. All of, this, all of these techniques can actually be achieved via radio artery access, as was previously talked about in one of the uh, questions, using a five French outer diameter sheath and a closure device with a balloon can be uh, used and with, uh, to, to close the radial artery, and this results in only a 2% risk of radial artery occlusion. And this is my favorite part of radial artery access, is the patient's awake, they actually can help you with the procedure by holding the, the wire or doing the injection. So in summary, uh, T-VAR is much superior to open repair for blunt thoracic aortic injuries. Uh, however, we need to be cautious because there's very little long-term follow-up data, and we actually need to be doing a better job of following up with these patients. The left subclavian artery is frequently covered uh, by uh, this, um, sorry, uh, for uh, blunt thoracic aortic injuries, and there's a very simple, minimally invasive techniques to uh, uh, enable subclavian artery preservation. Spasibia. Thank you for your presentation. Any questions? Comprehensive review, perfect. At uh, first, I want to agree with the periscope for the left subclavian artery. This is our policy, what we are doing. And I have a question for you about uh, what are you doing in case when you have a um, aortic uh, rupture with big hematoma, you excluded the rupture sign, and what you're doing with hematoma? What's your policy, what's your strategy? To make a drainage immediately or to wait several days and then remove the, uh, the hematoma? I'm sorry, this is, you're talking about for a perioreotic hematoma from a blunt thoracic Grade injury? Grade four sure. injury with rupture. Sure, so uh, actually we had one of those cases last week. I, um, in those cases, if they're unstable, my preference is to cover the injury first. Just cover the injury, then you access the left radial artery. You can easily uh, fenestrate that with a laser, bridge it with, a, uh, with an endograft, and then I leave the hematoma in the chest. Because I think that it, unless it's um, it, free blood in the left chest, then we will do a, a chest tube. But in terms of the metastinal hematoma, we don't do anything to it. And that frequently resorbs. Any questions more? Thank you for your presentation. And tell me, why do you not limit yourself with simple fenestration of the graft? What happens with fenestration holes? We had two observations, and no branching was demanded or restunting, a retrograde restunting. What's the problem with just covering it and do nothing? No. After you close, after you cover the left subclavian or left uh, common carotid, just limit yourself to fenestrations only without any additional stunting. 
what happens with fenestration holes, to your opinion? For the holes in the, uh, if you fenestrate the hole and then you stent it, uh, I think that, that those uh, do very well postoperatively as long as you have a big enough hole. So the key is to uh, balloon dilate sequentially. So I usually use a four millimeter balloon followed by a six millimeter balloon and then balloon ultimately to eight millimeters with the stent graft. And I think that those do very well. In our experience, none of them have occluded, knock on wood. Any questions more? If not, then thank you for your presentation, wonderful presentation. And now the next one. EVTM in non-operative management of uh, uh, abdominal, in abdominal uh, injuries. Dr. Lerarty. Всем добрый день. Спасибо, пожалуйста, организаторам за приглашение. Неоперационное лечение означает наблюдение. The first step is the emergency, emergency assessment and the damage control resuscitation to attempt life saving. The second step is the hemodynamic stabilization to switch uh, between surgical and non-surgical patients. This is done by a multidisciplinary uh, workup made by surgery, radiology, interventional radiologists. More and more uh, hospitals nowadays have a hybrid oper operative room. Hybrid operative room permits multidisciplinary team uh, uh, operation with multi equipments for anesthesia, for surgeons, for interventionalists. So the, operating, uh, the hybrid operating room permits combined interventions and uh, in the same time surgical and endovascular approach. How? With arterial embolization, to stop hemorrhage with the stent grafting to repair the damaged vessels and uh, with intravascular balloon occlusion to arrest and to prevent bleeding. You have, uh, to, uh, you have necess necessary to have 24-7 active skilled operators with all materials av available. You have to have uh, all the kind of catheters, micro catheters, uh, embolic agents, all kinds of embolic agents, metallic and, uh, and the liquid embolic agents, all kinds of stain graft and balloons. This is the most frequent, uh, the most famous um, uh, classification of embolic agents in permanent and the temporary. But you, you, you have to keep in mind that an ideal embolic agent does not exist. The, the, the combination of embolic agents is made by the operator and it depends on the situation and, oper, and the, on the availability. In, uh, in generally, it depends if you uh, can uh, get the, the bleeding and uh, you can choose if you have an end artery to embolize with the metallic agents or uh, if you have a collateral uh, decirculation, you can choose with a sandwich technique with embolization of proximal and distal, uh, uh, distal vessels. If you have an injury of major artery, you can choose for a, a, a covered stand graft. If you, you, not, you do not achieve the, the bleeder, you can perform a, a, a proximal embolization to reduce the, pre, the pressure, like for example for splenic embolization or with this embolization with the, embolic, with the liquid embolic agents. The other question is, what can I embolize? Everything. But in this session, I don't talk about aorta, liver, or kidney because other colleagues talk, uh, talk about them. Only a few words about spleen embolization. Spleen embolization is, uh, um, is uh, required with the, uh, with the grade of, of, a trauma, of a trauma is a grade four or five, and when the, the patient is stable. There are two techniques, proximal and the super selective distal embolizations. Which is the difference? Proximal embolization is the aim to, to reduce the pressure, 
and uh, the nixal embolization is performed as close as possible to the site of vascular injuries. The advantage of the uh, proximal embolization is to, uh, to, to reduce the pressure and to, uh, to help the, the, coagula the, the coagulation of the, of the, of the bleeding. And uh, in, this, in this way, you can reduce the, the infarct of the spleen and the, the risk of, of infections. Which are the limits of endovascular trauma, uh, of endovascular uh, management? The non-target embolization, the incomplete embolization, and now we will see if there are some contraindications to embolizations. Non-target embolizations occur when you use, for example, a stain graft and you risk to, to embolize um, vital uh, vessel. You, not, you, you have to keep in mind do not use embolic agents, for example, in this case, uh, when you have uh, punk, uh, arteries that, uh, that you have to maintain a patency, like in this case. Or when you, uh, or, or when you, you have to be mass sele more selective than possible to uh, to maintain the vascularization of the other recta uh, uh, arteries, like in this bleeding. Incomplete embolization is uh, when you are not able to reach uh, the black door, for it, for example, and the and the you. you you, you, you can try to, to overcome this limit using, for example, the polymer that is a, a one of the newest uh, embolic agents that uh, navigate very, very well in the, in the vessel and get the, the distal portion of the, of the bleeding vessel. Are there contraindications to embolizations? No, there are no contraindications to embolizations if the hemorrhage is life-threatening. Post embolization, uh, uh, we recommend uh, observation, clinical laboratory test, and the surgical revision of, uh, revision of the hematoma when, uh, when a compartment syndrome occurred. So, throwing, throw, to, well, throw the, the, the conclusion, sometimes endovascular treatment uh, may be not resolutive of time consuming or impair organ function. But now I show you two cases in which unstable patients were treated surgically, but, but the surgical approach with packing was not, was, not, uh, was not resolutive and endovascular treatment was required, like in this, uh, in this case with a, a mesenteric hematoma and in this case with, with hepatic uh, vascular injuries, major vascular injuries. So in conclusion, we can conclude that the endovascular treatment may convert a difficult bleeding scenario into a more controlled one. And uh, for the future, probably Riboa or uh, hybrid room may, may, may contribute to a, to a revision of approach and guidelines. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for your informative presentation. And now questions, please. Maybe uh, the presidium. Has questions? No questions, thank you. No, we do have a question. Did I understand you correctly that you recommend selective uh, splenic uh, branch embolization over proximal uh, embolization? That is actually a bit contradictory to some guidelines uh, at the moment. Some people think that it in specifically in splenic uh, embolization, the proximal is, is sufficient and uh, may save a bit more spleens. Yes, we recommend uh, uh, super selective embolization only when you can reach the, the bleeding and you can arrive as close as, close as possible to the bleeding so the, uh, the, the infarct and the ischemia of the spleen is, is minimal as minimal as possible, because when you are in an in emerging setting and sometimes you, you perform a combined intervention, you, the, the most important thing is to reduce the pressure and the, uh, to reduce the, 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 the bleed, the, the blood to the, to, the, to the spleen. So it uh, depends from the situation, in my opinion. We have one question more. I just wanted to say I really like your um, view that nothing is not amenable to embolization and actually the reason we don't do a lot of it is because of how unstable patients are. In our service we're hoping 
using Reboa to stabilize patients temporarily. We can push a lot more to IR, minimally invasive stuff that we just never normally consider, and we can reduce a lot of the side effects, complications, and effects of surgery. Not wanting to do the surgeons out of a job, but I think it's, it's a really healthy direction to head in. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. As, as continuation to that one, actually, uh, we did have some discussion. We have some seconds away, uh, time. We did have a discussion about the contrast media uh, before, and uh, there was a fresh review in New England, and uh, the uh, level of evidence to contrast media damage comes mostly from uh, cardiac uh, emboli catheterizations, and the level for CT venous uh, injection is almost zero. And uh, in uh, the fresh, uh, or quite fresh uh, bowel ischemia uh, guidelines for uh, uh, really compromised patients. Actually, the recommendation is that irrespective of creatinine values or anything, you should shoot a, a, a contrast okay. angio. So is that your experience as well, that the, the nephrotoxic, um, uh, nephrotoxicity of the contrast media is in these severe cases uh, not that much of an issue at all? Of course, but you refer to the cases that I showed before, for the for the for the bowel. I actually refer to any patient because oh. because any uh, nephrotoxicity is questioned. Okay, but depends on uh, the level of of, uh, of evidence now uh, is for mini invasive treatment and uh, a surgical approach may be performed before for bowel um, um, uh, ischemia. Okay, sorry, I meant uh, the contrast media for CT and the ah. contrast media for angio, so that, do you think that it is at all no. an issue? This is not a contraindication, in my opinion, because uh, you are, you are treating, you are, we are treating for uh, life-threatening hemorrhages, so in, at the moment, uh, then we can talk about this. Okay. Maybe uh, any questions more? Then thank you. And we pass over to the next presentation. Uh, how to stop the bleeding uh, when the liver is damaged. Lauri Handelin from Finland. Che uh, chairman. Audience, next eight minutes, I'd like to spare with you talking about the uh, juxtahepatic bleeding, retrohepatic venous bleeding. And uh, I need to tell that I have no, no personal uh, experience on venous endovascular treatment, but uh, because of this injury, rare injury is real, really a challenge for a trauma surgeon. Uh, I've been interested in this for, for some time. Sorry, it's not reacting to my... my uh, okay. Here we go. So, when we look at the liver injuries, you have the crates, uh, double AST crates from uh, one to six, and when we are talking about the severe injuries, we are talking about grade five. And you have those four Ps when you do your open surgery. You have, you can push, you can pack, you can do the Pringle maneuver, and you can plug. And in, in grade five, of course, you do the same, but still you are struggling. The, the juxtahepatic bleeding probably just continues. So what are we looking at when we are talking about the juxtahepatic bleedings? We are looking either type, type A or type B injuries. Type A means that the bleeding is coming through the disrupted uh, liver parenchyma. So liver is completely dis disrupted and there is some major vein bleeding in the parenchyma. Or then you have the type B uh, it may be that uh, the parenchyma is almost intact, but you have the torn veins behind the liver. Bleeding is coming around the liver. And uh, when we look at our experience, we took the uh, uh, 100 consecutive uh, emergency laparotomies on blunt trauma. 
we found out that uh, there were seven cases of juxtahepatic bleeding and six out of seven died on table. So the perioperative mortality was 86%. So it's, it's a huge number. And when you look at the literature, the, the numbers are from 50 to 80%, 50 to 90%. So this is the really a killing bleeding, uh, very rare. And individual surgeons, you don't get much of experience on, on this. So of course, push back, bring le, but what next? How to gain access to do the direct repair or, or the ligation of the bleeder behind the liver? You, you need to do something to, to isolate the liver completely. So total hepatic vascular isolation. You have the uh, atriocaval shunt, but I don't know how many of you have done that. I haven't, I have been doing that only on pigs. It takes time, it's difficult, and the reports are saying that mortality may be even higher with, uh, with uh, this shunt than without shunt. So you need to have something else, and you have the multiple clamping, uh, highest, uh, highest uh, pr uh, procedure where you clamp the thoracic aorta, you clamp the suprarenal uh, IVC, suprahepatic infrapericardial IVC, and you do your Pringle. But how about using endo and hybrid techniques in here? So when you look at the literature, uh, you can find this uh, nice study done by uh, Heldenberry uh, and uh, others saying that uh, they did the very nice uh, uh, survey or look, looked uh, through the literature from 90 to 2017 and they found 16 reports on uh, endovascular uh, treatment on, on, on veins. And only two cases where, where it was uh, inferior vena cava injury. There is this case report uh, coming from uh, Colombia with uh, one balloon in aorta, so riboa, and one balloon behind the liver sitting at the takeoff of the uh, li uh, liver veins. Uh, which is ribo, ribo C, Riboc. And uh, I've been trying to uh, identify the proper balloons. And there is this uh, bridge balloon, which is meant for uh, superior vena cava, and it's meant for uh, rupture of uh, 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 superior vena cava after the lead extractions. You have those pacemaker. Uh, uh, leads and stuff there sitting very tight and when you pull it out they, they may uh, rupture the uh, superior vena cava. So diameter 20 millimeters and length of uh, 80 millimeter could be uh, one solution for uh, retrohepatic uh, uh, liver as well. You have this Delcaf system for uh, liver chemotherapy but the problem is that you need to buy the complete set and it costs more than 16,000 euros so not feasible. Uh, and always when you, when you occlude your inferior vena cava, you have a major impact on the, uh, on the cardiac preload. And even a normal volemic patient tends tend not to tolerate that and think of a hypovolemic patient. So you need to at least occlude the aorta to support cardiac output. But nowadays we are getting more and more, uh, uh, the uh, institutes are getting more and more familiar with ECMOs. So when you do your uh, inferior vena cava uh, occlusion, it would be nice to have a vena venous ECMO to support the preload. And then, this one is coming from Victor, Russian retrievable uh, temporary retrohepatic IVC covering stent. It's still experimental. Last time I, I spoke to Victor, maybe someday it could be in, in a clinical practice. And the good thing is that when you put it in, there will be no effect on preload. So the bleeding from the liver after you've done your Pringle and you've put this stent on has completely stopped and still the preload is, is uh, intact. Very nice. And the idea is that you take it out after you've uh, been doing a surgery with your liver. And in the US, uh, there is this rescue stent and I, I can find two papers on it, but no clinical papers. On, on human use so far. Uh, 
this is uh, on porcine model, and uh, the report is saying that it's working nicely. Same idea, you put it in, uh, you, you have the uh, preload uh, on, you fix your liver, and then you pull it out. And there is one very recent uh, uh, case coming from, uh, from uh, I think it was uh, from Colombia also, with uh, stenting of, of uh, it was permanent, uh, permanent stent behind the liver, and they ended up having thrombosis and sepsis and had to do a salvage surgery later on. So probably uh, veins are not tolerating uh, at, uh, stents uh, that well as, as arteries are. So in summary, severe juxtahepatic bleedings are rare, but when you face one, the mortality I could say it's almost 100% if you, if you don't have uh, tricks to deal with it. Clamping occlusion is not very well tolerated. You need to maintain the, the venous flow from below the liver. And uh, the endovascular uh, tricks you have could be uh, balloon in cava and vena venous ECMO or one of those retrievable caval stents. And that's something I'm looking for uh, or to, to see in the future. Thank you. Colleague, is there any questions for the Any questions to the speaker, colleagues? May I ask you a question? My question is about implanting any kind of stents and grafts in the venous structures, in the venous lesions, in comparison with arteries. How fixed, how sustainable is the position of the grafts in, uh, for example, vena cava, because uh, when we, uh, well, we have, uh, when we use them in jugular veins, we know they are very unstable and in course of time they go towards heart. Is there any uh, problem with instability with the um, vena cava? Stand. I have no personal uh, experience on that, so I would like to address this question to Pirka. Maybe Pirka, you can comment on that, please. Well, we know of we know of stents in the iliacs, of course. We, that's a routine procedure for for occlusion of the iliac, and that's a very good position to put permanent stents into. But you have to, of course, take care of the inflow and so forth. But that's a bit of a different patient group. Um, uh, our experience is, is uh, from uh, the homografts and the, the NICE procedures, I mean the deep vein reconstructions uh, where we have had to put in stent grafts and yes, it's the same, they eat themselves through the, the vein, so the vein doesn't hold uh, the, the, um, the, the stent graft at least at, as good as, um, as arteries do. But uh, from this, uh, I, I, I definitely support the idea of having a retrievable stent, and I'm a, I totally agree with Lauri that we should take away something that is behind the liver. Uh, do, did you consider in your, uh, I, I know that a total uh, liver transplant at that point would not be a good idea, but, uh, but putting the patients immediately to uh, um, uh, a cardiopulmonary machine actually does, doesn't take very much time, so, so have you found reports on that, because that's something we do with, uh, in tumor surgery quite frequently. With, so we isolate the liver and, uh, and put them immediately on, on the machine. I know there are some reports on, uh, on uh, liver transplant in trauma, but maybe Laura, do you have any, any comment on that? My comment would be I've had a few of these uh, horrible retrohepatic cable injuries um, and my mortality is 100%. They all bleed to death on the table despite, you know, total hepatic isolation. Um, I have not had an opportunity yet to do a Reboa with a vena cable balloon, but I think, you know, based on my experience with just open clamping, I would prefer um, to do that because these patients are uniformly uh, very high mortality. Um, we see a fair number of these that um, we try not to operate on them because the mortality is so high. Um, if we do have to operate, um, a lot of times we'll recognize going in that we may need to go ahead and call our bypass team and, and have them come in. 
Um, and so we've had, I haven't personally had any, but uh, a couple of my partners have had success doing VV ECMO, but you really have to think of it and do it quickly in order to salvage these cases. The problem very often is that uh, the patient is so unstable that you don't have time to do any imaging. You go in and you operate and then you find that in front of you. So that, that's, the, that's the challenge. Any other questions, colleagues? Thank you very much, then. And let's go to the next speaker. Uh, the next presentation on uh, hepatic embolization for trauma, 14 years of experience in a single center, please. So many thanks. So I'm Catherine Arvieux from, uh, from France, and uh, I'm happy to present our experience in hepatic trauma. So uh, we are uh, a French group. So here is French, here are the Alps, and here is Grenoble. Uh, we are um, uh, located uh, uh, in front of the two main valleys uh, with ski resorts, 80% of French ski resorts. So we are one of the main trauma centers in France with uh, more than 100,000 emergencies a year and more than 500 severe trauma. Uh, we, we work a lot with our fellow radiologists and uh, interventional radiologists and other surgeons from all those centers around us. So we had a liver trauma registry since 1998, uh, and uh, since 2004 we we had 455 uh, liver traumas with uh, 48 embolization. Uh, so it's a, a more or less 10% uh, with a 44 blunt and 4 penetrating. Um, this experience we have already have published it uh, in 2011, and it was uh, in one of a very recent paper, a meta-analysis that uh, take, care, uh, take um, in account our publication. So what are our indications of uh, hepatic arterial embolization? And that shows that uh, there is not one indication of embolization, there are many. Um, the first and the most obvious, of course, uh, is a contrast leakage on the CT scan, and that was for um, two-thirds of our patients for uh, the discovery of uh, abnormal uh, vascularization like aneurysm or arteriovenous fistula. So that's a few patients. And uh, we, ha we perform uh, hepatic embolization without CT scan when the patient is unstable, like th those case, and uh, more or less uh, that's uh, our three type of embolization, I will say. Uh, so our median time to embolization was 3.35 uh, hours, but that's not the median time from the accident, it's the median time from the time the patient gets into the hospital. Uh, most, many of our patients uh, have a very long delay before we get them because it's a ski accident, uh, alpinism accident, paragliding, so it takes a lot of time to take them to the hospital. The good thing is usually uh, we are aware that the patient is coming and all the team is waiting, radiologist, interventional radiologist, surgeon, anesthetic, so we are just waiting for the patient and do as fast as possible. So in our theory, 62% of the patients were embolized within the first six hours. Uh, so there was a little bit more male, but uh, not that uh, pre incidence you all, always see because it's uh, uh, one or two the quarter are uh, mountain accident. Uh, the mean age is obviously young. Uh, most of the patients have severe liver trauma. 14 patients were in shock and they had embolization. So I think that is really, it's something in this journey that, that the take home message, you can embolize patient uh, if you do it very fast. Uh, one month's mortality was uh, three cases among 40, 48, and one case was preventable. Uh, he had um, uh, a lesion of the biliary duct, uh, which was unknown, and our main hepatic complications were inflammatory syndrome, abdominal compartment syndrome, biliary leak and biloma, and liver ischemia, abscess or necrosis. Um, here are the techniques we use. I go quite fast. 
most of the patients had coils of uh, resorbable gel, and uh, more anecdotic, prosthesis, plug, lipiodol, and some patients have combina combined devices. The circumstance, primary hepatic arterial embolization at the admission, 25, uh, 27 cases, combined, combined uh, hepatic arterial embolization, that means that more or less at the same time, a embolization then laparotomy or laparotomy then embolization. Secondary uh, hepatic embolization after damage control, that means uh, after six hours, five cases. And for quite some patients, non-operative management, then uh, hepatic arterial embolization, uh, discovering that there was a bleeding when the pressure of the patient was getting a little bit higher uh, after, um, after care. Uh, so the first uh, uh, hepatic embolization success rate on hemorrhagia was uh, 94%. In three cases, we performed re-embolization, so that means the success rate on hemorrhagia was 100%. Uh, we operate quite a lot of patients, seven hepatic packings uh, with four pringle maneuvers, two temporary, and in two cases, uh, we use uh, the tourniquet uh, lift through the incision to release it in the arteriography room to allow embolization. So that is very useful because still we're going to have a hybrid room, but we don't have it. So it's a little bit like having a hybrid room, just take the patient with a lift like this. And it works pretty well. And in my experience, uh, at least um, one patient had uh, uh, two embolization, one of the kidney, one of the liver, and uh, he had the tourniquet for uh, one hour and 10 minutes, and uh, there was no consequences, no necrosis. He was young, so we, are, we get him pretty soon, but it works. Uh, delayed surgery for uh, almost half of the patients, for delayed hepatic resection, for uh, big necrosis, uh, we perform a lot of lavage uh, laparoscopy because we find that the patient get out of the hospital sooner, and one laparoscopic cholecystectomy only for uh, the very classic uh, necrosis of the gallbladder. So um, what I will say is uh, lift Pringer maneuver to allow transfer from operating room to angiography is feasible, and probably you can do it in an hybrid room too. Uh, for it, we ruled that we should have this hybrid room. It would have been very useful for one sixth of our patients. The liver ischemia necrosis rate is 13 percent. The success rate is almost 100 percent. And there is this very nice recent meta-analysis uh, from Virdis uh, that show almost uh, the same uh, the same uh, uh, thing. Uh, so I will conclude, so we have some time for the discussions. That is the main, I think, um, important thing to, to remember. That means that uh, uh, one to ten of uh, hepatic trauma underwent, underwent hepatic arterial embolization in our experience. That's a lot. That means that if a center uh, has a sufficient experience of hepatic trauma, it will have experience in hepatic embolization too. Uh, less than four hours is really something the aim to, to, uh, to, to be sure of the success. One half of the patient will need surgery, and we really uh, work together. And in the end, I think uh, uh, radiology, international radiologist and surgeon uh, in my center. And uh, one address process is, uh, is the rate of success of uh, hepatic embolization. And be, because I have one second left, so I just say many, many thanks to Victor, to his team, to everybody, because uh, it, it was really a privilege to discover uh, your uh, audience and this wonderful city of uh, St. Petersburg. Thank you. Any questions? You're welcome, please. A very interesting presentation, huge experience in uh, this field. Any questions from the presidium? A question about um, your relationship with your interventional radiologist. It sounds like you work quite well with them. Do you have a protocol for when interventional radiology gets activated? So if, let's say it's after hours, they're not in the hospital, or are they always in the hospital? How do you decide when to deploy that team that may be having to come in from home and, and utilize that resource? Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. Yeah, really, it's, 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 very, it's very important questions. Uh, the fact is actually uh, in my center, uh, interventional radiologists uh, do the REBOA too, and uh, uh, they are not uh, present in the hospital, but they are uh, quite uh, uh, easy to, 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 to make come, and they come very fast, because usually a patient, it's quite rare that we have patient in, in very few minutes, so we work with them. Uh, we talk about that, and I think uh, we try to, 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 they try to teach uh, the anesthetic to put the reboa on, and it didn't work very well. But it was the beginning of our experience. We used the 12 French catheter, and the, the results were not good. So maybe we should try again, or maybe uh, should the surgeon do it too? Um, I'm seriously thinking that everybody should uh, have the capacity to put a reboa and to, to wait for an interventional radiologist. I always go with, uh, when I take care of a patient, it's really happened very often, I put the packings and I, and I go to the, uh, to the radiology room to see them doing, and I saw how, how long it takes to teach uh, the, the, the resident to do uh, interventional radiology. It's not very easy on those very hypotensive patients. Sometimes they have something like uh, the arch of the cellular trunk, and there are many, many uh, things I have to know. And I think it's a little bit like surgeons for me, and I feel very close to them because an experienced radiologist in interventional is very useful. You can let a young one do something, but it, it, needs, it needs to have his senior not too far. So. I think that maybe because it works so well, because we share om about almost the same experiences. Any questions? Yes, there are no questions. Then thank you, Anne. And we pass over to the next presenter. Modern approach to pelvic bleeding from pelvic belt and surgery to VTM, Federica Coccolini from Italy. So, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much for allowing me to. I, I, I'm going through something that is not, 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 uh, not really new because the, it was asked me to, to, think, to, to speak about the modern approach to pelvic plating, but we know that the EVTM, so the endovascular approach from pelvic breathing, has been known and applied from many and many years. So there is uh, something that is continuing to work because the packing from peritoneal space is something that has been introduced nearly after the embolization and fixing of the, of the pelvis. So the pelvis was fixed by orthopedicians and, man and managed by endovascular uh, interventional radiologists. Then packing was introduced, and there is then two different schools starting to, to, to manage with the pelvic uh, severely injured from patients from pelvic ring. So we can see that the different guidelines apply angioembolization and packing together with the, the fixing of the, of the bones part of the, the pelvis from many and many years ago. The different guidelines continue to, to introduce. There are different even uh, part of the guidance that have been updated introducing what is the real new thing that happens in severely in injury patients from pelvic uh, side. The reboy, the endovascular ballooning, and something that has been introduced within the different algorithm to allow to take some more patient to the, to the, to the curability. Because we, we, we are, when we speak with, uh, regarding this kind of patient, we, we consider as much the, the, the most part of the more severe patients. So, what concerns the responder patients, we have nothing to do than take them to the EVTM or the definitive surgical treatment. So, we have nothing to speak about because it's something that we already know. For what concerns the transient responder, so those patients that uh, transiently answer to the, the feeling, we have different possibilities. But we are treating this kind of patient when we speak regarding the rebo and the, the advanced endovascular and hybrid management, because we are trying to push as much patient as possible back to the curability, because many of these patients 
can die of the trauma by itself, of the bleeding, of the consequences of trauma associated to severe bleeding, hypothermia, and the other associated factors. So when we speak regarding the new tools of the management of severely injured patients in the pelvis, we are thinking about this. And we can consider that the REBOA and the other system to temporarily reduce or block the arterial flux to the, to the pelvis uh, arterias is mainly REBOA and the, and the new introduced systems. Because uh, uh, looking to the uh, register that is uh, promoted by the guys from Rebro, we can see that among the th 300 patients that have been enrolled, 72 patients underwent uh, uh, reboa and aortic ballooning for a pelvic trauma. And all these patients, almost all, are, are brought, were brought to another different uh, procedure thanks to the reboa that reduced the mortality and, and or the time to die for this patient, that increase, sorry, the time to die or the time uh, disposition of the surgeon in order to have many other different solutions to try to solve. If we see the other uh, court of patients published by, by the French guys, 32 patients with a, a such aggressive uh, reboa positioning uh, algorithm, we can see the same. So we have no definitive data. We have something that describes which are the patients who are, who are undergone to, to the, to the reboa position for uh, pelvic, severe pelvic injuries. But we know, we have no definitive indication of about when to, to, to place the reboa and what to do, because we have no definitive strategies. We are managing to, to reorganize the trauma team with different figures and to teach to them how to manage with reboa. It's a recent paper that show us uh, many people, well-trained, but not uh, already trained uh, in precise, in, in precisely on, in managing with reboa and vascular access, can learn in so in, uh, in very short time to manage with this kind of, of situation. But the main thing that have been published and already shown is that if we decide to pass over the already existing algorithm and try to introduce something new, we have to, to find a, to say, the way to set up a system that has, be, has, has to be adapted to the system in which the, the algorithm is started, and not the contrary, because this is something that maybe can work in some centers, this is some issues that can be fixed in different centers, but not in all. So we have to, to face with our proper center and our proper system and to set up something, but, but we need somebody who is in charge to manage, because it's something that links the different figure and departments in order to have the best result as possible. So to conclude, we think that, I think that the new approach doesn't exist. We, we continue to use the different approaches that we, we learned and we must, as already said by the colleague from South Africa, we must learn how to manage with the different surgical strategies and different vascular strategies. Then. When we have learned how to manage with those, we can even consider to introduce something new in order to increase the number of patients that can be taken to the treatability of the severe injury that they, they suffer from. Because without managing the, the real old one systems, that are the, the ones that are still working, we cannot consider to introduce something new. We can introduce something new if we have no, if we lack, if we lack some passages of the, the chain, to manage with the patient, as, as already told during the day, because many people show that reboa is used when surgeons are not so efficient in managing their part. So the other colleagues from the hospital try to, to fix the, the lackings of the surgeons. So the guidelines already introduced, and the trauma team is modifying the roles in order to increase the possibility to treat these patients. But the centers, in order to introduce the new tools, must create dedicated protocols and figures in order to manage it properly and to not misuse or overuse, because we have to think that many of these new tools are even bringing many new complications and many new dyes. So we can have, even have patients that can die from the new tools and that maybe can be saved with the old systems that the that the, we, we already used, that we have been using since now. And the last one is that the training is mandatory. So maybe we should consider to, to form 
some dedicated figures that learn in deep how to manage and then pass to the other colleagues the different skills and management, because everybody cannot be exposed sufficiently to some kind of maneuvers that maybe are very rare in many centers. And so this is something that exposes everybody to, to the risk of high risk of, of damages and of, of uh, failure in managing new tools. Thank you very much. And thank you. Any questions, please? A crazy idea of me or from me. Maybe this goes to all of you in the audience. We spoke about the retrievable stents. Would it be, I don't know, I'm asking you guys, would it be any, any feasibility in uh, having retrievable uh, external iliac stent for bleeding uh, pelvis? And next question, could that be done blindly without fluoroscopy? Just put the retrievable stent in external iliac, resuscitate the patient, and then start thinking later what you do with the stents. If, if I understand the question, you're speaking when the, the bones damage the, the artery, and then to manage with the... the no, no, I'm, I'm uh, speaking about the acute, bleeding, shocked, non-responder. So you put the stent in external iliac, so you cover the takeoff of the internal, so the bleeding stops. Oh. But the, the, the flow maintains to, to your lower extremity. So could, could that be uh, one tool, EVTM tool, taking care of, uh, of the uh, non-responder uh, bleeding pelvis? But it could be considered something like ligating the internal iliac artery in which in, uh, in patient when you already packed, and then you have to manage even with uh, arterial bleeding. But it has been demonstrated that it works not so efficiently as the, the endovascular uh, approach. So I don't know regarding this approach. I never thought and I never applied this. And the second answer is doing this blindly, it could be a little bit uh, complicated in emergency settings because this kind of patient we are speaking about are patients that are going to die in maybe 30 minutes and maybe less if we are not stopping the bleed. So I don't know if the, this can, I don't know. Just an idea. Maybe it will be easier to use contralateral uh, approach on both sides and selectively cover the internal uh, iliac arteries with a balloon. Why? Because how, why have you to, to, to manage with intravascular system in order to reach the contralateral part in a patient that could be managed with endovascular definitely angioembolization? Why have you to, to manage? If you have a damage iliac artery, it could be interesting. We, we did. In one case, we have the bones that cut the, the, the iliac artery, so we pass through the, the, the health one and we go on the lateral, on the contralateral artery and we stent that artery. That's why I have you to, to put something inside without directly coiling and then try to, to embolize. If you are, because if you know that there is something arterial that is bleeding, maybe you already fix the patient as much as possible in order to reach the, the angio suite or, or the hybrid or the homemade hybrid room in the, in the vascular, in the operating room. I think maybe taking further from Laurie's idea, this could be a device for the field or something like that that you're thinking about. Because um, if the patient already is in the hybrid suite, I think there's a lot, lot of techniques that you can use. And the balloons take care and the legs tolerate that time. But if you have long transport times, you do that and pelvic packing, I don't know if that would have any, any better uh, results than putting a reboa and holding that there for two hours. The, the, the main issue is that blindly in the field it could be very difficult to place that because they demonstrate, United States guys, they demonstrate that blindly placing Reboa 
it's very difficult and very hard, especially in the lower part of the body, because the, the, the biometrical uh, measures are very different within the different people. So something that is, could be very interesting, but very hard to manage with. Aure is actually an expert on this one. Can you comment on the distance uh, of the uh, bif aortic bifurcation from the groin? You studied this on cadavers. <laughs> Sorry, uh, the, uh, the study is still uh, going and I don't uh, have the exact, exact figures yet, but yes, we are studying that on cadavers, but there are a lot of studies done on trauma CT and we, we know we know the, the distance is quite well, but uh, we are looking at that in Scandinavian population. So 100 cadavers and very, uh, very uh, meticulous uh, uh, distances, uh, thickness of the fat and uh, everything. It's coming up, but I, I can't tell it now. I don't have the exact figures for you. Colleagues, еще вопросы, комментарии? Any more questions or comments, please? No, then thank you. And we pass over to the next presentation, selective embolization of uh, arteries in the comprehensive treatment of uh, GI bleedings. Dr. Chicken, you're welcome. Good uh, afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, great thanks to the organizers of such a representative conference. In the course of uh, the next eight minutes, I will present our almost eight years experience of using angioembolization in treating GI bleedings. The topical uh, the topic is quite important, and uh, no matter how efficient the medications are, and no matter how good the endovascular technique is, we still have a high rate of mortality among severe patients, patients with comorbidity, uh, elderly age, also defects, and especially among those who we have to operate on because of the vital signs and urgency. Uh, when I started, when we started our work in uh, hope to help uh, by uh, PCI methodology to our patients, um, we, uh, uh, we we started this work at the same time uh, as endovascular program was deployed in our. Uh, emergency hospital. Uh, in international classifications that we see, uh, you, that you see on the slide, and also the national standards that were adopted, uh, the national clinical guidelines that we adopted in 2014, uh, we may use endovascular approach uh, during recurrent uh, hemorrhages and be in uh, failing attempts to do hemostasis. These are the patients with gastro hemorrhages in our unit. Um, uh, uh, and we have, we're treating around uh, 300 patients per year. Uh, when choosing the method of treatment, we uh, uh, very quickly came to a conclusion that proximal embolization, despite being easy in doing, uh, has more hazards because it may cause ischemia of the organs. And uh, you can see here the conditions after embolization. This is a selective slide, and you see almost no ischemia. Uh, well, we quite uh, quickly um, uh, defined what are the direct signs for hemorrhages. Uh, it's extravasation of contrast, thrombotic occlusion, and uh, false aneurysms. There are indirect signs as well. Very often we see them, and we very often because of them we cannot localize the source of bleeding. Uh, the most frequently used angiographical uh, occlusion uh, of um, uh, duodenum and uh, stomach is presented here. It's the embolization of the uh, uh, left uh, gastric artery. You can see the extravasation of contrast. 
This is another uh, uh, embolization in the basin of the left um, uh, gastric artery. Here is the result of treatment of the patient. This is Sorry, I skipped my slide. Well, uh, to show you that we regularly use this practice, these are the um, uh, images from the cat lab made this night. A similar situation uh, to the one I showed before. A typical situation when we have the hemorrhage from the ulcer of duodenum, uh, we see extravasation of contrast uh, from gastroduodenalis. And uh, this is a standard uh, technique that we use. It's a retrograde approach uh, in gastro to gastroduodenal artery when we cannot go uh, in a traditional way. Through celiac artery. I'm sorry, for some reason, uh, I, I can't upload my videos. This is a hemorrhage uh, from the peptic um, ulcer, and we uh, did the approach uh, from the um, upper mesenteric artery. Uh, today, in our experience, we already have 196 visceral angiographies in gastroduodenal hemorrhages. 43% are embolizations in the basin of the left gastric artery. 47% uh, in gastroduodenalis artery and 10% of angios are not ending up with embolization for a number of reasons that I will mention in a minute. The most frequent anatomic locations of ulcer are uh, the posterior wall in the duodenum and the small um, the tortuosity of uh, the of the stomach. Uh, with age, the number of patients is increasing, and uh, we now think that in the risk group, we need to use this method. The prevailing patients are elderly patients. Uh, how do we do embolization, and what is the spread of the patients in the group? Well, indications for embolization are inefficiency of primary endoscopic hemostasis, inefficiency of therapy, high risk of recurrency, and a recurrency of hemorrhages. The majority of patients have a high risk of repetitive hemorrhage with severe blood loss. So there is a very interesting observation here. What do we see on angiography? Around half of our patients don't show any extravasation of contrast, and we can only rely on indirect signs. One third of the patients, uh, uh, we see extravasation on them, and this is the most reliable way to do embolization, and about 10% of the patients on them, we cannot do embolization because we either cannot catheterize the target lesion because of the complicated anatomy or atherosclerosis, or we can't do it because there are no signs of hemorrhage. In our practice, we had four inefficient hemostasis uh, cases, uh, uh, and one case was with extravasation of contrast and three cases without extravasation. Recurrent hemorrhages, eight patients, and in five of them, we did um, uh, uh, secondary embolization, and three uh, uh, and five um, patients were um, went on emergency surgery. Nine patients had a delayed surgery. These were patients with huge uh, uh, stomach ulcers, and in the majority of cases, these ulcers were penetrating. Significant complications. We had two cases. One was an elderly patient with comorbidity. She had a, um, Um, she had uh, cancer uh, of pancreas, and um, 
we did uh, occlusion. We uh, also, uh, in the second case, we did an occlusion on the uh, liver artery and the patient was healed. The results, uh, among 95% of the patients, we had the non-operative treatment of hemorrhages and we did efficient hemostasis and plus conservative treatment. Operations, 5.3% of cases. Overall uh, mortality rate in uh, uh, gastroduodenal hemorrhages, 4.1%. The highest risk group uh, and with highest uh, lethal outcome are elderly patients with comorbidities. On this way, there are lots of difficulties and unsolved problems, but still we can recommend this methodology for uh, complex treatment of other patients and complex management. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Questions, please. Questions from the audience. We can't hear you. Please speak on the mic. Good afternoon. Thank you for your presentation. Please tell me, how do you decide uh, your indications for embolization? Which scores are you using? I mean, the patients who had efficient endoscopic hemostasis. Which scores are you using? In which, uh, in how many per uh, percentage of the patients do you do embolization? Let me start from the end. Angiographic criteria were presented on my slides. Well, the angiographic criteria are extravasation, continuous hemorrhage, thrombotic occlusion of the lesion, and aneurysmatic uh, ch uh, changes. Uh, and these are the direct signs of hemorrhage. Also, the distal lesion changes, uh, recalibration of the lesions, convergence of the lesions. And in fact, this is something which we very often see uh, together with chronic ulcer. We see the uh, transformations in the anatom anatomy of the distal lesion during chronic ulcer. Uh, well, uh, for embolization, indications for embolization are high risk of hemorrhage. Uh, we use SPRK2 score, but the main parameters are uh, uh, elderly age, uh, hemorrhage, comorbidities, and the size of ulcer defect. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Any other questions from the panelists? Thank you very much, then. And we have the next speaker. Uh, he will be speaking about EVTM in urological and uh, gynecological bleeding tumors. My name is Adenauer. I'm from Brazil. Thanks again for this wonderful opportunity to be here. And I will speak about urological and gynecological embolization for bleeding tumors. So, gynecological bleeding tumors, the most important indication is for fibroids. Since 1995, it, it has been an involving technique. And the most important indication for uterine fibroids are heavy or prolonged menstrual bleedings. We use MRI images for it's the most, uh, MRI images are the most useful images modality for planning uterine artery embolization. The technique consists on aorta angiography, so you can localize the uterine artery's origin. And then you do internal iliac angiography. It's very important to do it in the correct uh, angulation, so you can find the, the origin of the uterine ar artery. And then you do bilateral uterine Art arterial embolization. What can you expect if you do uh, the bilateral artery embolization? Regarding to bleeding, uh, it will eliminate ab abnorm abnormal uterine bleeding in more than 90% of the patients and with no significant outcomes for the normal uterine parenchyma. You can stratify complications between major complication major complications 
when readmissions to the, to the hospital is needed and minor complications. Fortunately, less than 1% of the patients require hysterectomy. I have 45 cases and I had two major complications. I will show one of these cases. It was a 36-year-old patient, very obese, with bleeding requiring blood transfusion. Uh, the gynecologist called me and asked me to embolize her. The MRI showed multiple fibroids and a very, very huge uterus with more than 2,000 centime cubic centimeters. We did the artery embolization. It went all okay. And then almost one month later, the patient was with abdominal pain, vaginal discharge, no fever, and CT showed gas in the uterus, and the gynecological examination showed pus flowing through the vagina. So, patient went to the hysterectomy, and the correct diagnosis was endometritis. Actually, there was no myometrial necrosis. What have I learned with this case? First, to discuss the image with the radiologist. And in case of embolizing big uterus, if there is no active bleeding, no major problems. But if there is an active bleeding, we need to ask the gynecologist to do an aspiration of the uterine content after the embolization, because retained blood can become retained pus. Uh, this is a very good uh, paper, and actually we can find gas in the uterus after embolization, even when there is no necrosis, but the pattern of the gas is different. There are a lot of, of controversies and polemics regarding uh, uterine artery embolization. Some authors says, say that location of the fibroid doesn't matter, and others say that fib uh, the fibroid location is an important issue. Others advocate you shouldn't do embolization for big fibroids. Others say there is no problem on embolizing big fibroids, large fibroids. But one thing the literature agrees, it's safe and effective. Uh, I think good judgment is very important. You need to discuss every case with the patient and with the gynecologist. And regarding urological bleeding tumors, renal embolization has become the first line for many situations. We are going to talk about angiomyolipomas. Angiomyolipomas are benign, relatively common tumors. It's important to define if you are going to do a selective or a non-selective arterial embolization. Of course, if you can spare some nephrons, it's always best for the patient. So we try always to be selective. Uh, these tumors happen in about 3% of the general population, and they account for about 20% of all peripheric bleedings. Prophylactic embolization is indicated for when the tumor is larger than four centimeters, and in some other situations, pregnancy and estrogen contraceptive could raise the bleeding risk. There are many technical considerations and debate, but the most important, in my opinion, is about the embolic agent. Every time I can, I prefer to use microspheres. I will show you two cases, one elective. This patient was 25 years old. She had tuberous scler sclerosis, and she was submitted to a prior nephrectomy 10, 10 years before. We did this elective procedure using uh, microspheres. And as you can see, there were two big tumors. We choose to do only the inferior lobe one, and come back in a second day to do this, the, the one located at the upper pole because of the amount of contrast media the patient had already taken. And this was an emergency case. Four days 
uh, after a C-section, the patient didn't know she had these tumors, the, the, kidney, the kidney ruptured, and we did this in the emergency situation. You can see arteriovenous fistulas, microaneurysms. In this case, we used both microparticles and microcoils for the, for the aneurysms. You can see the big perinephric hematoma on a CT done three days after, and after 10 months, she was still with some functional in the renal parenchyma. Of course, there are some complications, but, and this is my last case. Uh, I have only one case of selective vesicle artery embolization. It's very rare to need to do this. This patient was 46 years old. She sustained pelvic radi radiotherapy for uterine cancer and was with this gross hematuria. And we did the selective embolization with no bladder necrosis. The, uh, the patient went very well. And best regards from the Amazon. I thank you a lot for this amazing opportunity. It has been an honor. And thank you. Questions to the speaker, please. If no questions, then thanks once again, and we pass over to the next presentation. And the vascular hemostasis, when the bleeding is from hepatopancreatic bleeders. Good. Uh, afternoon, dear colleagues. We have the most patient delegates left in the room. My presentation will be about uh, endovascular hemostasis when we have hepatopancreatic bleeders. Strange as it may seem, patients with bleedings more and more are admitted after endovascular or other uh, minimally invasive interventions. Besides, we have many patients after combined expanded vascular plasties uh, in the hepatopancreatic uh, area. Uh, and the vascular hemostasis secures low uh, mortality, while laparotomy and other interventions uh, are accompanied by high level of mortality. The second large group of patients that demand endovascular hemostasis are patients with uh, uh, degradable tumors of uh, hepatopancreatic area, destructive pancreatitis and the sequelae, and uh, the experience of uh, our clinics, general and uh, hospital surgery at the military medical uh, academy is as follows. 40 patients after complications including uh, uh, low invasive technologies, uh, drainage of cysts of uh, pancreas, stunting of uh, gold tracts, and other um, percutaneous interventions. There were some patients with hemorrhagic complications after low invasive procedures, uh, usually after uh, gastropancreatic duodenal resection and other expanded resections. We carried out endovascular hemostasis for these patients in the majority of cases for uh, arteries, but sometimes uh, there was a need to embolize the veins and uh, uh, stent grafts used for arteriovenous uh, vessels. Uh, also non-resectable tumors of uh, hepatopancreatic uh, tumors and patients with hypertension syndrome. Embolization, usually we use mechanical uh, embolic agents and stent crafts. Hepatopancreatic uh, bleeders are peculiar because aside for arterial access, we very often use uh, percutaneous transhepatic access, trans, uh, Hepatic, as I've said, and this uh, complicates the procedures a bit. And the vascular hemostasis, after, um, at, in case of post-op bleedings, 
after expanded uh, interventions, for example, anastomosis uh, due to chronic indurative pancreatitis, after the uh, intervention, an expan uh, MS bleeding developed and uh, uh, the embolization was needed and the vascular hemostasis. The bleeding was stopped and the patient uh, uh, recovered. The patient, after expanded the intervention in the abdominal area, uh, the liver damage developed, uh, subcapsular hematoma of the liver with ruptures in CTA extravasation in the zone of seventh segment was detected, and the source of uh, the bleeding was uh, a branch of uh, uh, the portal vein. So the puncture of uh, portal vein was carried out with ultrasound control and uh, embolization of this branch, uh, the bleeding stopped. After gastropancreatic duodenal resection, sometimes patients develop uh, pseudoaneurysms in the area of uh, superior mesenteric artery and uh, microspirals have to be uh, implanted, uh, 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 microcoils, sorry or stand grafts. Also, the bleedings may develop after low invasive uh, interventions, chronic post-necrotic pancreatitis, for example, and uh, the cyst uh, developed. Uh, it was uh, resected, but after the operation, the bleeding uh, started. Embolization of gastroduodenal artery was carried out, uh, and the bleeding stopped. The patient recovered. Patients with non resectable tumors of hepatopancreatic duodenal area, very often they are incurable. That's an interesting case a large tumor, hepatocellular carcinoma of the left lobe of the liver and uh, migration to the right lobe. Uh, tamponade was carried out. Uh, uh, the bleeding was not stopped. The patient was uh, referred to our clinic. Embolization was carried out of the hepatic artery and then expanded hepatectomy. Patients with arterial portal fistulas very often have bleedings uh, from uh, esophageal and uh, uh, gastric uh, veins. Uh, that's why to stop the bleeding, we need to perform embolization of these vessels. Uh, the head of the pancreas uh, degradation with massive uh, hemobilia, uh, urgent stunting of uh, gall uh, biliary tracts had to be perf uh, performed. The deployed stand graft stopped the bleeding and then chemotherapy was performed. The patient uh, survived for three years afterwards. Bleedings uh, in case of destructive pancreatitis, very often uh, blood uh, comes from the large uh, duodenal papilla. And you see uh, pseudonibrism of the spleen artery. Selective angio was performed, and uh, uh, the contrast uh, in the area of uh, pseudonevrism uh, shows uh, uh, radiopac duodenum, and um, we carried out selective embolization of the uh, low branch of uh, spleen artery, and the bleeding stopped. There's a large group of patients uh, when they have uh, syndrome of portal hypertension demand uh, urgent interventions. Very often, transregular um, shunting uh, has to be performed. Very often, percutaneous uh, transhepatic and embolization of uh, sh uh, foam sclera obliteration of uh, short veins of the uh, bowels. <clears throat> The efficacy of our endovascular interventions amounted to 89%. In some cases, unfortunately, there were recurrences for patients who had post-op bleedings, and this uh, demanded real laparotomy and uh, re-embolizations, no mortality in post-op period. <coughs> Relapses developed in seven cases, Reembolizations were effective in all cases. 
severe complications uh, in the form of abscess of the spleen and total uh, spleen infarction uh, was seen in two cases, but the patients recovered. Six percent of patients, six uh, patients died because they had uh, very severe tumors of hepatopancreatic area due to progression of uh, hepatic insufficiency. Thus, uh, endovascular hemostasis, me uh, hemostasis methods are highly efficient. Usually, uh, uh, it is uh, more efficient to perform this in hybrid OR. Re-endovascular intervention may be performed and compared to other regions, when we have bleedings in this area, we have to know how to uh, secure venous uh, uh, access or transhepatic access that may help in some uh, difficult cases. Thank you. And thank you for your interesting presentation. Questions, maybe? Presidium. Personal experience about these embolizations, but we do see, see the patients frequently with uh, uh, pancreatitis and, uh, and uh, um, pseudocysts to the uh, spleen, splenic artery. But but you said you do a lot of um, embolizations through the transhepatic uh, to the portal branches. So maybe I missed some details. But what what kind of patients do you use, and how, how often is it needed? transhepatic approach to uh, bleeders. In case of five patients, we had to perform transhepatic access when they had bleedings from portal vein. There was a picture of a patient with a trauma. In all cases, it was uh, very efficient. Transhepatic access is also used in case of portal hypertension when there is a bleeding from esophageal veins and the gastric veins. Any questions more? Then thank you, Sergey. And next presenter will be um, Munich Chana, who will tell us about pre-hospital endovascular interventions. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Victor, Tal, uh, thank you so much for having the opportunity to present here today. Uh, I was very inspired, sat in the crowd last year, so it's a real pleasure and a delight to be on stage here today. So we published our case series in pre-hospital Reboa earlier this year. So I won't spend time uh, talking about the justification in the implementation of this. But what I'd like to talk about is some of the key lessons learned from the London's Air Ambulance experience with pre-hospital Reboa. The first key point is to talk about patient selection. So in the study period, London's Air Ambulance attended over 8,000 patients. Reboa was attempted in 21 of these and was successful in 15. They had a median ISS of 38. And so what we can take from this is that this is a small group of severely injured patients with a specific injury pattern. It's the feeling of uh, highly experienced clinicians with years of uh, experience in trauma and pre-hospital care that these patients are actively dying from their injuries. The second key point is that pre-hospital Reboa reverses shock. I've included uh, a figure here from the paper which illustrates that pre-hospital Reboa significantly increased the systolic blood pressure from 57 to 114. And this was sustained through to transfer to the emergency department. This is in contrast to the patients where Reboa was unsuccessful who had a sustained decline in their blood pressure and our median balloon occlusion time was 80 minutes. So if we look at survivors, so we had a 62% survival rate. There were no pre-hospital cardiac arrests in the Reboa group and no deaths due to exsanguination. And interestingly, Reboa was seen to have a therapeutic effect in six patients, which raises questions about a possible therapeutic role alongside its more established resuscitative role. 
if we compare this to the patients where Roboa was unsuccessful. So these patients had a 50% hypovolemic cardiac arrest rate. There was a significantly higher rate of death due to exsanguination. And most interestingly, failure to achieve Roboa in all of these cases was due to failure of ultrasound-guided percutaneous access. So looking at side effects, we observed a high rate of early arterial thrombus, but this is on the context of a high rate of crush injury and primary vascular injury. So it's impossible to tease out thrombus that is a side effect of the river boa versus thrombus that's generated uh, as, a, as a result of the injury mechanism and pathology. However, we take note of this and we now expect it as a side effect. So we're now proactive at looking for thrombus and dealing with clot expectantly. There's been mention today of the importance of reporting complications. Uh, and to that end, we report three episodes of superficial femoral artery cannulation, uh, one of which required a patch angioplasty for repair, and one instance of zone two Reboa, although this had no clinical significance and required no renal replacement therapy. When we examine amputations, um, as I said previously, these are patients with a significant lower limb injury. Within the Raboa group, there um, were four primary amputations for non-salvageable uh, limb injury. And when matched against the patients that, where Raboa was not um, unsuccessful and not performed, there was no significant difference in amputation rate. So, the lessons learned are that pre-hospital Reboa is a feasible technique that can be performed in pre-hospital care to manage a rare but distinct cohort of critically injured patients. Reboa significantly improves shock. It reduces the rate of exsanguination, and there is a high rate of distal thrombosis that should be expected and managed proactively. And there is no increase in primary amputation. So in terms of future progress, we will continue uh, with our Zone 3 Reboa uh, service. And things we've learned to take in terms of progress to Zone 1. We currently accept that we are missing patients who may benefit from Zone 1 occlusion. However, our 80-minute occlusion time is unacceptable in Zone 1, and this would have a deleterious physiological complication. So our strategy to mitigate this is to implement a partial Reboa. We've seen some fantastic examples today uh, of how trauma systems need to be improved to deal with these patients. Um, and the key, the key priority needs to be moving the patient quickly from the pre-hospital phase to definitive hemorrhage control procedures. With training and experience, we've become much better at making the diagnosis of exsanguinating hemorrhage. And we recognize the, uh, the possible use of ultrasound in helping with this diagnos diagnosis. We certainly recognize the uh, importance of early femoral access. And given that all the cases where Robert was unsuccessful was due to a failure of percutaneous access, we recognize that we need to look at alternative methods of getting access in these very sick patients. Say spasiva and invite any questions. Спасибо. Пожалуйста, из президиума вопрос. Questions? And uh, congratulations again. Uh, the experience of the London Air Ambulance is something that I think we all strive to create in our own pre hospital systems. I just had a couple of questions. Um, the high rate of thrombosis, I think, is something that you know y'all have certainly looked at, and uh, we're interested in as well, because it's it's very different than what we're seeing in our U.S. experience, despite you know some similar injury patterns. Um, do you have any information about uh, thromboelastography in these patients? Are, are you guys using that as uh, TXA, uh, maybe potentially playing a role? Is it administered pre-hospital, and could that be contributing? And then my second question related to the 80-minute occlusion time, how much of that time is spent in transport versus, you know, in hospital just waiting to get to definitive hemostasis? 
Um, to answer your question about uh, road term analysis, it's not something we specifically from the Institute of Preoperative Care have looked at, but there is data that's been collected and I think is being analyzed by Professor Brohe's group and, um, and uh, Ross Davenport. Um, and in terms of transfer times within that 80 minutes, I think we're, we're pretty quick at getting patients from the scene to ED. And one place I think we all recognize that we're spending too much time is in the recess room and transfer to CT and then transfer from there to theater. That's uh, a window that we know we can improve upon. I have another question regarding the 80 minutes of inflation time, the, me the median. So maybe the, the, the confidence interval is, is broader, so it's, it's more yeah. prolonged. So some people maybe have maybe two hours or more of inflation time. Certainly some of the earlier cases, yes. It's you, you mentioned the primary imputation as something, a proxy of the damage that the inflation time can bring to the, to the legs. How many people have major complication as compartment syndrome maybe needed, fasciotomy or something else? Make, can be, that can be related to this prolonged inflation time of people? Um, I'm, I'm not sure we can confidently say that the amputation rate is just due to Reboa. We think it's, a lot of it's due to mangled extremity injuries that were non-salvageable in the first place. And although it's small numbers, when we compare the patients who receive Reboa versus those where it was unsuccessful, there was no significant increase in amputation rates in the Reboa cohort. Have you got any data on injury profiles of these cases? Injury profiles, what kind of injuries do you have managed? Uh, so predominantly blunt injuries, um, it's cyclists. So it's, you know, anatomies cy of bleeders? Sorry? The What kind of anatomies? The bleeding anatomies? Have you got any data? Bleeding what, sorry? The which, which, what are the bleeders in your cases? The bleeders? Yeah. Source of hemorrhage. So junctional vascular injuries and pelvic hemorrhage. So, so these are um, motor vehicle accident patients and uh, so forth. So uh, multi there's a potential of liver injury and spleen injury and uh, maybe cardiac even. So um, how do you select the patient? Because if you use zone three, I think this is a follow-up, uh, you use zone three as your Reboa place, right, at the moment. At the moment. I, I appreciate your, your going to, towards zone one. But uh, how do you s know where the bleeding comes from? So what is the indication, kind of? So our, our indications at the moment um, is a clinical diagnosis uh, of exsanguinating hemorrhage, which is based on a set of clinical signs with uh, an appropriate mechanism, an appropriate assessment of injury. And at the moment, as I say, we are limited to zone three. So we're looking at pelvis and junctional vascular injuries specifically, but recognizing that we are we are seeing patients with subdiaphragmatic injuries, but we, we can't be inflating zone one balloons in, them in a pre-hospital phase at, at present. You guys do fast pre-hospital? We're, we're not doing pre-hospital fast ones, no. Um, Having this, uh, um, oh, please. I just wanted to pick up on a point um, on diagnosing them. It's a really big challenge we found, but we are, so we're only putting it in the hands of very senior clinicians that see a lot of trauma and we train them even more quite extensively on making a clinical diagnosis and it's amazing how hard it is when something like this hinges on your clinical diagnosis how challenging it is but we think if you spend care and attention out of hospital without an ultrasound scanner without imaging you can quite accurately diagnose the pattern of injury from the history and a bit of detective work on scene and, and it, it is hard but for, for many patients, you can quite confidently make a diagnosis. You just have to be really careful about how you examine them. Um, and just picking up on your, your question about thrombus, we are puzzling over it a little bit as well, but we, there's a few differences. We, there's a lot of tranexamic acid used in London because of the way it's um, seen as a target. And also the balloon that we've been using here is slightly different, so it's an embolectomy balloon that's floated back to the bifurcation as opposed to the ER Reboa catheter. We've just moved to the ER Reboa catheter. We have the capability now to do zone one, and we are beginning to do that in, with partial occlusion. So things I think will change. Maybe it's because you guys partially occlude, shorter balloon times, we're out of hospital, and, and on the 80-minute thing, 
it's really hard to get a patient from the floor to an ambulance or a helicopter into hospital through resus and up to theatre in any less than 60 minutes or so. So that's the reality. If anyone's thinking about this pre-hospitally, you have to be able to manage that because th your times won't be shorter than that. So we haven't started doing pre-hospital robot yet, although I would love it if we could make that happen. But one process we have started in our trauma center is the uh, heliport to OR process where we completely bypass the recess area. So we've given our flight crews the ability to phone in to the trauma surgeon on call and say, I have a patient that has these criteria. I just want to go straight to the OR. And there's a brief discussion between the flight crew and the surgeon. And if we think it sounds like a good indication, we just skip the recess area altogether. So maybe that's something to mitigate some of your time that you're having is to come up with an agreement with your trauma surgeons. These are the cases, and I think you can make the argument that a patient that has a Reboa inflated probably needs to skip the recess bay and go straight to the hybrid, hybrid room or the OR or wherever you're doing your, your endo. There's a question from the floor. Uh, thanks again for the great message. Uh, two short questions. The first is, uh, uh, these Reboa patients, did they automatically get blood products pre-hospitally? And the second question is, there is a, another invasive procedure you London guys are very famous for. This is our resuscitator of uh, thoracotomy. Just to compare numbers for these four years, how many thoracotomies did you perform? We looked at that. <laughs> um, lot, yeah, so the answer to that is we've done lots of thoracotomy. Um, and we've, it's been looked at uh, data going back to the last 10 years. Thoracotomy for blunt injuries has an almost well has a hundred percent mortality rate. So we're looking it's we're looking at Reboa as a, an alternative method. Uh, in terms of blood products carried, is it three units on the helicopter, three units of red cells? So now we're, we're carrying three units of whole blood pre-hospitally, which we which we can give. In, in one of the slides, you had the target or, or the actual systolic blood pressures, that, which seemed a bit high, well yeah. above 100. So, so what is your target? I mean, that's not uh, permissive hypertension, is it? <laughs> no. I, I don't, wouldn't really say we have a, a target pressure that we aim for. Um. No, I mean, because we are sort of back in a horse in these patients that we believe aren't bleeding above the balloon. We just aim to get the balloon in, and because of this technique, there isn't really any titration to be done because it's a single inflation floated to the bifurcation. But with the new balloon, whether it's zone one or zone three, we will always partially occlude. So we'll inflate for 10 minutes, leave scene, get in on the way to hospital, and then we'll always let the balloon down. And exactly as you say, if blood pressures are high, we'll let the balloon down. We'll let it down further and further and further, and we can afford to let it down completely if we happen to resuscitate the patient, make them better, get to hospital. We don't need occlusion. We minimize balloon times as, as much as we can. How about the thrombus removal? Is it always open, or do you do endovascular aspirations as well? I think so far it's been open embolectomies and groin explorations. Question, yeah. I have a brief question about approach. If you are observing an open trauma of a lower limb with uh, open wounds, have you ever considered um, the uh, introduction of the balloon through that open wound when we have significant soft tissue traumas or the ruptures of lower limbs, for example? That's tempting, isn't it? Uh, the Standard operating procedure we've developed um, states that we would aim for a contralateral healthy, healthy target vessel rather than access using uh, an injured vessel. There was from um, Handolin a question. Yeah, co comments on, on the previous uh, question regarding pushing the balloon in for the uh, injury. That's something you can do with the liver when you have type A uh, grade 5 injury and you have the open vein sitting in front of you, you can't like it, it's, it's coming from the parenchyma, but you can put the balloon in, any balloon, urinary catheter for, for temporary uh, closure. Uh, but uh, my comment to 
to the thrombosis, very high number of thrombosis. What we've heard from Norway when they do the uh, postpartum uh, hemorrhage reboas, they mm. started to, to, to have, or the, when they started, they had the sheet with the length of 11 centimeters, which is the normal sheet, normal introducer we use, 11 centimeters. But when you look at the anatomy of the external femoral artery, it starts, when you come from distal to proximal, it starts to go down, and then there is quite a steep uh, 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 corner, uh, kind of a twist in, in, in the artery. And when you have the 11 centimeter sheet in your femoral artery and you do the CT, you can actually always, almost always, see, see the tip of the sheet sitting at the corner. So meaning that when you move your legs, the, the tip of the sheet will, you know, uh, have some uh, mechanical uh, uh, disturbance with the adventitia at, at that corner. And that's why Norwegians, they, they, they changed to have 23 centimeter long sheets to when, when they lift up the legs, when they do the gynecological uh, 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 positioning of the patient. So is there any chance that uh, the legs or, or the sheet actually is moving on your pre-hospital patients, and that's, that might cause intimal uh, injury uh, uh, proximal to inguinal ligament. That's a very interesting, uh, interesting point. I think, yes, there's, there's potentially a chance of it of moving. You're moving these patients off, off the road onto a, onto a scoop and into the back of a truck, and then there's the transport time. Uh, we're securing these with uh, tegaderm dressings and the Reboa operator is designated to keep a hand on things, so we try to minimize any kind of movement that's, that's not precise. Well, I think that this remains a controversial issue, uh, and uh, I think we have to be very grateful that the British people are, are taking this very critical, typical UK approach <laughs> to it, because uh, in many places, we would just start to do it. And the, the, the line between putting in a reboa on stage or, or doing just scoop and go, that must be very difficult to define. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult and it feels very scary. Um, actually, it doesn't help if someone puts a camera in your face when you're trying to do it. Um, can I, I just wanted to make, uh, I, sort of make a point, if I may, and answer a couple of questions that have gone throughout the day. There have been, as there often is, lots of questions about the optimal team and who should be doing this, whether it should be a vascular surgeon, interventional radiologist, an emergency um, medicine doctor, an interventional, uh, uh, an intensive care doctor. We've all got different skill sets. There are questions about where it should be done. Is it safe to do it out of hospital or in the recess room? you know, how do you make a bespoke team? There are so many questions around how we should do this, whether it's out of hospital or in the recess room. And I've noticed also a few people sort of um, not knowing, I think, maybe about how many deaths your systems have out of hospital. I might be wrong, but actually until we looked at it, we didn't really have as good an appreciation as we should of how many patients die pre-hospitally, exsanguinate pre-hospitally. And I guess our experience so far shows us that we, this is possible, you can do it. Um, it shows us that, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter actually who, who, what your specialty is. You can train people to do this. Uh, we talked about bespoke teams, but actually we have a team of three people with a lot of strangers on scene and we use people as we can. It's really difficult, but it's possible. And my point to finish would be that I would challenge everybody to look into their data in your own country, your own region, your own system, and find out how many patients each year bleed to death before they get to you. You never see them, you never hear about them, you don't even know they exist, possibly. And with that number, sit down and have a think. Is it okay? Or is it not okay? Are they unavoidable deaths? Or actually, should they be avoidable deaths? And the question is, as difficult as it is, how do we change it? You know, do you think you guys could fit this into your system or not? And, and do you accept those deaths that happen before you can save them? 
Also, we have to know the injury profiles and timeline of deaths, you know, how quick, quickly they die. So all those questions have to be answered to find, uh, to save more people. Yes, and uh, uh, one easy way of putting it is people have asked who, which patients need this or, or should it happen. Actually, I think the patients have already given us the answer because some patients die. They've told us the answer. Do they need it or not is not a question. Of course they need it. They need something. So the answer is there. It's just a case of how do we do it? How do we make it safe enough? Okay, colleagues, the, this question provoked a discussion, passionate discussion. Uh, thank you to the speaker anyway. And let's go to the next point, uh, the next speaker. And our next speaker, the final speaker in this session, uh, will speak about extracorporeal um, uh, cardiopulmonary reanimation, CPR. Uh, Dr. Uh, Shalukin, please. Very long day, like marathon, 12 hours. Uh, so my name is Daniel. I work here in Russia in St. Petersburg, and I want to talk about a very severe uh, group of patients. It's patient with asystolic refractory uh, CPR. So... I'm sorry. So if, if we'll talk about uh, some technologies with uh, extracorporeal extra cardiopulmonary resuscitation, of course, we can uh, see uh, this one device. It's a uh, mechanical chest compression. But my opinion, it is not uh, comfortable for the endovascular surgeon. And all of you know it that, of course, uh, in operation room, it isn't uh, comfort. Much better to use uh, the Another one technology effective C CPR, uh, for effective CPR, it's ECMO. Uh, it is not uh, easy to do it in uh, emergency department uh, to connect patient to ECMO support. And uh, sometimes it's, you need about uh, 10, 15 minutes for VV or VA ECMO support. Um, and much more difficult to use it uh, outside the hospital. You just uh, heard a previous presentation about pre-hospital stage, Rebo and uh, ECMO. My opinion, quite difficult to do uh, outside the hospital in uh, pre-hospital stage. For example, in subway or in museum, it's a Louvre or anywhere. It's really very difficult. Uh, which one contraindication for ECMO? My opinion, if we'll talk about trauma patient, uh, I focus on prolonged CPR without adequate tissue perfusion or refractory CPI. It's a really interesting uh, prospective uh, investigations uh, during uh, 28 years. A very big experience of our colleagues in uh, Tromsø. It's Norway, extremely low temperature in their region. In our <clears throat> country, there are a lot of regions with extremely low temperature too. And we can see that before 1999, uh, they have not survived a patient uh, with trauma associated with uh, asystolic refractory CPR. But the situation uh, changed after 1999, uh, uh, thanks for ECMO support, and uh, so, uh, survived uh, was about 38 percent. And uh, it's a quite good result, because you can see international re register survived uh, during a CPR by ECMO support about 30 percent. 
Um, the lowest measure core temperature of the patient was less than 14 temperature, uh, 14 degrees. And the period of refractory CPR with uh, asystolic was about seven hours. It's, it's really big time. Uh, you can see that uh, interest to eCPR during uh, trauma, during trauma with se severe refractory CPR or bleeding more and more during the last uh, five, seven years. Which one advantages can give for us ECMO? Uh, of course, we, you can do it immediately in, inside hospital or outside hospital. Um, the second bonus, you can uh, prothesis oxygenation or CO2 remove. Uh, biventricular support, sometimes we need it, and um, sometimes very severe case when you can see combination of uh, severe pulmonary and severe um, circulatory insufficiency. And in this uh, situation, ECMO can be bridge two. So the first case I want to show you is it was in, a, in our hospital. It's 27 years old uh, young man with a very severe uh, trauma of the chest, uh, multiple uh, rib fractures, uh, more than 14 on both sides, a very severe situation with uh, lungs contusion with total hematoma of the lungs tissue with uh, bleeding and uh, during uh, next time the patient's lost tidal volume without possibility of uh, artificial ventilation. Uh, it was a traffic accident with the patient. It's uh, CT scan uh, pictures in our hospital. You can see no gas inside lung, absolutely. Uh, so we used uh, VV ECMO and uh, during uh, in hospital stage period, we have some problem with quite stable ECMO support and different kind of parameters, uh, continuous bleeding and uh, bronchitis and uh, intrapleural ble bleeding. We uh, thought about some kind of endovascular technologies, but in this case we use um, endobronchial blockaders and regular uh, sanitation with good result. And another one case, uh, it's interesting case, and in final I will ask you about this case, about your decision. Uh, so it's a patient 62 years old with an open gunshot wound with multiple damage uh, to the organs of the left health priority of the chest, um, multiple fracture of the ribs, hemopneumothorax, mediastinal tissue contusion, and very, very severe hemorrhagic shock. For the next uh, hour, cardiac arrest was repeated many times, uh, more, uh, more than uh, 19 uh, defibrillation, um, and uh, the surgeons cannot to continue uh, make their uh, job, they, they, they couldn't walk the bleeding continued and hemorrhage shock increased time uh, during next minutes. So uh, it, it was another one hospital and we, and when we uh, come, refractory assistal was more than two hours and respiratory volume was about 100 milliliters only. Uh, there is uh, low parameters of uh, uh, hemoglobin and uh, lactate acidosis, you, you can see on the slide. So, what we have uh, done, left side pulmonectomy, partial um, resection of the left rib, uh, partial ligation of the arteries on the left, uh, tight tamponade of the left cavity. What we have uh, done, stable, absolutely stable hemodynamic after more than two hours re refractory. Can I ask, uh, please, uh, a little bit time? Uh, 
Just one minute, uh, thanks. Uh, so we st stabilize uh, hemodynamic and uh, ab absolutely stable sinus rhythm with uh, good parameters of oxygenation. Uh, on laboratory tests without any uh, uh, signs of uh, 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 severe coagulopathy, uh, ECMO therapy continues. And if you see on the slide, uh, total infusion was about 45 liters during uh, five hours. Uh, fr fresh frozen pl plasma, 15 liters, thrombocyte, 2 liters, and uh, blood component, about 11 li liters. So, uh, the cause of the patient death during next uh, eight hours after operation, we transfer him from operation to ICU, and the cause of his death was uh, not heart or respiratory failure, not DIC, but continued bleeding against the background of normal coagulation indicators. It's a dramatic situation for surgeon. ECMO technology allowed to continue the operation, stabilize the patient, transfer the problem from anesthesiology to greater extent to surgery problem. What uh, technology could make a difference final for the patient? I hope today you already have the answer to this question. But for me, the question open. Uh, which one zone? How many balloons? Which one type of VV, uh, of ECMO support? I mean, uh, upper and lower part of the body. And which one uh, hypothermia? Thanks. Благодарю за очень интересный доклад, который открывает, наверное, окно в будущее нам. Interesting presentation that opens a window to the future for us. Any questions? Maybe. Yeah. Uh, I, I want a little bit broken tradition ask audience uh, speaker. So I want to ask audience and experts. Uh, what's your decision in this situation? What was his neuro exam? Did he have reactive pupils? Were there any you know, signs that he had any neurologic function? Because that's what I would think the most about with two hours of CPR is maybe you can stop the bleeding, but what, what are your chances of having a functional neurologic recovery for a patient with that? Duration of but of you CPR. don't know about it uh, continuously. You will know about it uh, maybe after a few days only. So, what's the decision? I'm going to ask another question. What did you think his neurological status was going to be like? I know that sounds obvious because we know what you did, but what, what to rephrase it, what made you think he should have more? What were the things we can't see on that slide that made you believe it was worth more? Uh, I don't know. Gut feeling. The feeling in here. You, you mean after operation? No, before, I think there's some things you can't describe with data. There must have been something there that made you think, we've kept his brain alive, we have a chance. But I just wanted to know what were those positive factors? Uh, the main idea exclude uh, zone uh, in interest of intercostal arteries to separate upper and lower part of the body. And after that, uh, slowly, not quickly, to decide question with uh, intercostal hemorrhage, continuous hemorrhage, by uh, Reboot technology, of course, and by intravascular support. I'll give you my short answer to what I would have done. I wouldn't have considered ECMO only because we don't have it available right now in our hospital. So even though we're a major trauma center, we have to call someone from a neighboring hospital. It takes too long. And we do have cases n not quite as complex as this where I want to give it and I can't. So thank you for showing us what is possible.
It's amazing to see what is possible if you push harder. Okay. Thanks. Uh, one comment. The, all this endovascular trauma management and various new techniques will, will, will save the patients that we have never saved. And it will, you know, with that, the surgeons will get a, the injury profiles that we never exposed. As well as if the surgeons were successful, then the intensivists get the major shock patients that they have never exposed. So with the with AVTM program, there's a parallel development should be there in the surgeons as well as the intensivists. All three sides should be developed together to save patients. Otherwise, we will shower from one death to another level. Thank you. Have a question. У нас есть вопросы из зала, пожалуйста. We have a question from the floor. Failure at the, the major, major cause of death. Excuse me, I, I didn't hear a question. Gut failure. Failure in the abdomen. In the case, bowel and the gut after case, prolonged hypoperfusion. Uh, you think uh, it play, plays a role? Yeah, like, uh, well, like usually, uh, I don't know, about 80% of, of patients without any problems. If, if you mean, uh, how could I make ECMO support with a balloon inside uh, first and uh, third zone? Yeah, no? No, I was thinking that uh, it was, uh, it's so prolonged, the hypoperfusion state uh, probably uh, makes uh, as a, a principal target uh, a bowel dysfunction that may evolve in a gut failure, which, is, uh, uh, which might be um, an underestimated cause of death. What do you think about it? Uh, for example, you can use uh, by ECMO support a very severe hypothermia, and in this case, you can uh, take time about 30, 40 minutes without any complication for gut. Uh, and for example, in cardiac surgery with the arrest technique. Uh, quite safety time about 50, 60, with the temperature 15 uh, degrees. Colleague, is there any questions? Any questions more? Then thank you. We have... Uh, finished with our agenda, four sessions, and we're very glad that if we discuss the benefits and the necessity of temporary balloon occlusion and position this method today as a method that allows to deliver the patient to the medical institution to prepare for intervention, to perform it in comfortable conditions. Uh, we see in terms of endovascular methods of uh, stopping the bleeding, we see that this is uh, not only an auxiliary method as of today, but uh, very often a definitive uh, method that allows to low invasively and quickly stop the bleedings without uh, accompanying damage to organs and tissues. Besides uh, anesthesiology, uh, opportunities grow on a day-to-day -day basis. The main thing is for us, to secure good functional outcomes for these patients. And I pass the floor to Victor Reva for closing remarks. Esteemed colleagues and guests, it is not that often that by the end of such a long conference day, 12 hours, see quite a lot of delegates in the room. So my thanks to all of you for your time uh, we tried to make this event an important and large event in the surgical world of uh, Russia for surgeons, uh, uh, endovascular, vascular surgeons, emergency doctors. It is a multidisciplinary uh, approach, AVTM approach that is being lobbied by Talcor, 
Horror and DVTM Society. We thank all the guests who have come over because it's you who made this conference such a success. We hope that you liked it. Our foreign colleagues, our moderators, who were uh, monitoring the timelines and the experts with their wonderful comments really enrich the discussion. Great thanks to everybody and great thanks to our esteemed interpreters. As far as I could listen to them, it was great work. Thank you for your 12 work hours work. I do not know why you're still sitting there. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to Data Forum for a wonderful organization. I cannot see any technical flaws. Everything was done very well. Our organizers, the Green Group, Marina, Irina, who have done all this organizational work, have always been in contact with you. My colleagues from Military Medical Academy, from the EMS institutions uh, named after John Elizens, Klifasovsky Pediatric Academy, Russian Surgical Society, all the societies that have been with us, and geologists, uh, vascular surgeons. This is really great work. And we thank you all <coughs> for participation. Maybe uh, someone of you will uh, I uh, would like to take part in the Denver conference in November. As far as I remember, Chuck Fox will be hosting this conference for two days, uh, November 16th and 17th. All those who wish, you may find all the information at our website and at GVTM website. You may enter the society as members. Uh, Tal mentioned what it means for global surgery and for our Russian surgery. We still have space. Uh, a lot of space to develop. And I would like to ask Bogdan uh, Kotev, Major General, Deputy Head of the Military Medical Academy, to come up onto stage with his final closing remarks. Dear colleagues, dear guests, my predecessor practically summed up today's conference in full, and being a general surgeon, I have always been sure that only general surgeons may spend 10 to 12 hours uh, behind the operating table. But endovascular surgeons uh, seem to be as resilient uh, due to their enthusiasm, experience, and their wish to develop these technologies. Endovascular um, solutions are developing, and today's forum is a very important event, both for the city of St. Petersburg, for the medical institutions that took part in the work of organizational committee and the military medical academy that promotes the development of these technologies, including provision of medical care in difficult situations when we are threatened by terroristic acts, local, technogenic, and military conflicts when we have mass casualties. It seems that endovascular technologies are rather simple, but behind uh, this simplicity, we know there are huge uh, organizational uh, efforts, huge uh, uh, costs in terms of uh, both money and labor. And this is especially topical for such a huge country as Russia. And these technologies certainly require huge efforts in terms of training the specialists, sharing the experience, and I'm practically sure that the knowledge uh, we all receive today will become a foundation for further growth and development of endovascular care in case of traumas and wounds in the Russian Federation and all the other countries. We uh, uh, shared our experience. We heard stories from practically all the countries of the world, from the US to Japan. So once again, Great thanks to all the participants, all the speakers. Best